Tzvi, fake Tzvi or Howard? Me, either one. Either one? My real name is Tzvi. Tzvi, okay, so it's, it's Tzvi will be Tzvi. Today's uh, October 12th, 2018. We're in, what neighborhood are we in now? West Hollywood. West Hollywood. And we're with, uh, I forgot your last name, Tzvi. <laughs> Tzvi Rosenman. Rosen. Tzvi Howard Rosenman. Tzvi, Tzvi Rosenman. Rosenman. And if you can, before we get into the depth of the art of the interview, you can just give me a little intro of who you are and where you're from and the connection to, of course, we're going to be speaking about your parents, uh, but if you can just give me a little intro of who you are. Um, my name is Tzvi Howard Rosenman. I'm a movie producer. I've produced over 43 movies. My last movie, Call Me By Your Name, was up for four Oscars and won Best Adapted Screenplay. I also made Father of the Bride and Family Man and Buffy the Vampire Slayer and A Stranger Among Us. I made, I made five documentaries, uh, one of whom which won an Oscar about the AIDS quilt called Common Threads and won a Peabody. Uh, I made Celluloid Closet about the history of gay and lesbian images in film, which was nominated for an Oscar, won me my second Peabody. Uh, I was born in Brooklyn uh, and moved to Far Rockaway uh, on Long Island, the southern end of Long Island. Um, I went to yeshivas my whole life. My parents are seven generations born in Israel. My father, Meyasha Arim, on his father's side. On his mother's side, uh, my, my father's great grandfather's great grandfather came to Palestine in 1840 when he was 40. When he was 40? Yes, and his oldest son was called Chaim Talesnik who was my grandfather's grandfather, who founded the first matzah factory and the first talus factory, first in the old city and then in Me'a Sharim, and the signage is still there. Okay, and my nephew is my old, I have a sister that lives in Rabat Shlomo, she's Haredi. Uh -huh. My nephews are allowed to bake their matzot at that mafia. Uh, only people from Me'a Sharim are allowed to. On my father's mother's side, um, she came from Poland, in 1892 with Chavavet Sion, they moved to Machanayim, it didn't work out there, they moved to Tzfat, and she moved to Me'a Sharim. My mother was born in Bateha Hungarim in Shari Chesed, and on her mother's side, she's seven generation Hungarian, and on her father's side, Reb Tzvi Hirsch Rosenfeld, who I'm named after, he was a Sofer Stam, and he walked from the northeast of Hungary, Mausel, wine country, Shatrai Uhili, in 1902, it took him nine months. Interesting. I interviewed uh, a few months ago Rabbi Yoshua Stamper. He lives in Portland. And his, he's named after his great grandfather, who was Yoshua Stamper, who was one of the founders of Tikva, who walked from Hungary also, but a little bit before that, I think it was like in the 1870s or 1880s, but also did the, that journey wow. from Hungary yeah. to Palestine. It took him nine months. Insane. Yeah. Same. Insane, insane. Um, this interview is, uh, I, I mean, the archive that I work for, it's called Toldot Israel. And basically what we do is we interview people who were 16 and older in 1948. Now, a lot of the times uh, we, these people have deceased and that's why, for example, we're, we're talking with second generation people so at least we can have their stories in the archive told by their sons, by their daughters, so basically what we're doing here today is we're going to be, we're, I want to, to talk as much as possible about your parents and about, because they were in, they were in Israel at that time and apparently they, they were in Israel in 48. They, they left Israel in 1929. They left Israel in 1929. My father left in 28, my mother left in 29. Okay. Because of the Ma'oraot in Yerushalayim. Okay, so apparently... They wanted me to talk about your mother and father's experiences. If, well, if it was pre-48, then it's pre-48. I didn't have a lot of info about them because usually I get bios on everybody who I'm interviewing. But with them, I didn't have it. It was just Ari asked me to speak to you. So apparently, we will talk about this. So I want to go parent by parent if we can. Okay. And let's start with your, with your mother. Okay. Uh, she, as you said, she was born in... She was born... In Batei HaHungarim in Sha'arei Chesed. In Sha'arei Chesed. But you said that, okay, so her family was in Machanaim before. And no, no, no. My father's okay. mother from okay. Poland okay, sorry. was in Machanaim. Okay, so we're going to start with your mother's side. She was born in, in Sha'arei Chesed? Yes. In Ma'asha'arim? 
correct? Is no, Shari Chesed is outside of Me'ah Sharim. It's where the Wolfson Towers are now. Okay. Um, it's in the west side of the city. Yeah. Um, but she grew up in Me'ah Sharim. What kind, what kind of, what kind of, like, what, what, what form of Hasidim did they belong to your mother's family? Halberstam sends Satmar. Okay. okay. My father's side is Karliner and um, Karliner. Uh, my mother's very, comes from a very, very religious family. I mean, my father comes from a religious your family. Your mother's too. name? Most Sima. Sima and her, and her maiden name? Rosenfeld. Rosenfeld. That's her maiden name? Yes. Okay. So... And uh, she's born when? She was 79 when she died in 2001. So she was born in 75? She was 79. 79, so she was born in 1923? Yes. Something like that. Yes. And my parents moved back to Israel. My sister moved to Israel about 30 years ago. She's Haredi, and she lives in Ramat Shlomo. Ramat Shlomo, I know, I know. Right. I know that neighborhood. So, but my parents moved back to Israel. So your mother is born in what is called Palestine? It's Palestine. In, in they both came to America with British passports. Palestinian mandate, mandate exactly. passports. Exactly, right. Now both of the, so, so your mother grows up there, but she leaves when she's six. Yes, Okay. seven actually. Seven, she leaves at the age of seven because of the 1929 uh, exactly. riots. Right, exactly, exactly. Were they affected by them, in, uh, like, like yes. family-wise? Yes, like they, the, my mother remembers it and was freaked out. And my grandmother, who was, uh, oh, what was her, Klagsbrunn. My grandfather, who was a Sofer Stam, he wrote the Sifrei Torah in Israel, mm -hmm. okay? Took him a year each, I think, and dunked himself in the mikveh every time God's name was mentioned, 6,800 times. And then brought the Sifrei Torah to America okay. and raised money for the Shul and Shari He died in 1949. Um, no, in 1929, and my grandmother was a widow, and she came with all her children, seven of them, to America. Her eldest daughter moved to Rio. To Rio? Yes. My mother has a sister that's like 20 years older than her. Who lived in Reno? Rio. Oh, Rio, sorry, sorry. She met a, a Brasileiro, Jewish, and she moved to Rio. My mother rem remembers her wedding, which took a week. So your mother's, your, so your, fa your grandfather dies before they move to the United, to the United yes, States. Yes, right. So your mother goes with seven or six children? Seven. To the United States? Right. And where, where, do, they, where do they end up? In the Williamsburg. States? In Williamsburg. Interesting. Um, do you know who Avi Weiss is? I do not. He's a rabbi. He's the, the, that yeshiva, uh, that uh, the rabbinic school that the rabbis don't recognize. He's a very famous uh, rabbi. He's my cousin. He's your cousin. And so her life takes her to the United States. Right. Let's talk, now let's get, we're going to go chronologically. Now your father, when is he born and what is his, he name, was his full name? Moshe Yosef Rosenman. And he was born, I think he was four years older than my mother. Okay. He was born in 1919. Okay. Exactly. In Measharim. In Measharim. Yes. And he remembers it very well. And they also had a summer house in Sfat. Really? Mm hmm huh. And the, the house was dedicated just recently. There's, there's a sign there that talks about it. Why was the house dedicated? Because? Because it was given, uh, long, complicated story. <laughs> um, my, um, my great grandparents, Shabtai Kirschenbaum and Hudus Nussbaum Kirschenbaum, they um, had seven children, and um, their eldest, Shalom, who Shalom was named after, they came to Israel in 1892, around there. They Ali moved Ali to Machanayim. Yes, but they, moved, they came with Chovavet Zion. Zion. They were religious Zionists. And they came to Machanayim, where the Rothschilds gave everybody a dunam of land, clay chaklaut, uh, agricultural tools, and a chamor. But it didn't work out there, okay? A lot of people died of malaria and typhus and whatever. 
After two years, they left and they moved to Tzfat, where the house was. So the family had a house in Tzfat. Then my grandmother, who was engaged to a man that had one leg, and at the engagement, she ran away, she wouldn't marry him. <laughs> so she moved. Because she'd never seen him before. Right. <laughs> she moved to Mea She ran away. Where she met my grandfather, who was two years younger than she was. My grandmother was a Kirschenbaum. Okay. So her oldest brother, Shalom, there were seven of them. Shalom, who was born in Poland, in Tarnobzek, Tarnov, came to Israel. Somewhere around 1902, they all went back to Poland for a wedding of my Shabtai's sister's daughter. Okay. okay. And at that wedding, the 13-year-old Shalom was affianced to his first cousin, Devora Nussbaum, and he stayed in Poland and was massacred during the thing during the Holocaust. Everybody else went back to Israel, and one family um, settled in Haifa, and they're kind of secular lefties. Uh -huh. One family settled in Yerushalayim, Penina Kirshenbaum, who you might have met, her father. One family settled in Tzfat, Moshida he was called, Moshe Yehuda, and he had 14 children, and he was a chassid. And he, um, Seven boys went to the yeshiva in Tzfat, but the seven girls went to the lycée. To the lycée. lycée. What's that? A French high school. Uh, Alliance. Yes, Alliance. They went Alliance. to the Alliance. You know what's funny? In Jerusalem, right? No. Oh, not in Jerusalem? No. Because the Alliance girls school in Jerusalem is, the building is where I went to high school. It wasn't Alliance anymore, and it was built in 1898. Wow. But anyways, it's another story, but it's not that, okay. She went to some French school. <clears throat> Alliance, Alliance Francais. In Tzfat? Yeah, they, they were all over, right. all over the country, yeah. She got very influenced by French... Um, culture, literature. Culture. Now we're away from my mother, we're now on my father's side. We're on your father's side, yeah, yeah, yeah. Father's yeah. mother's side. Yeah. <clears throat> um, my, so, <clears throat> my father's first cousin, Chaya, Moshida and my grandmother, Saftalea, were brother and sister. Okay. okay. So he had 14 children, the seven boys went to yeshiva, and the girls went to Allianz. She was very influenced by French fashion. Chaya met, in 1941, met a boy who was wearing a white uniform, very handsome, 22-year-old boy. He was working for the British police, okay? He was, but he came from a Hasidic family in the same town that my mother came from, okay. Shatrai Uhili left, came to Israel because he was a Zionist, and or volunteered to work for, became, got a job as a cop for the British. Sure. Chaya meets him. They obviously made eyes at each other and it fell in off. love. But my grand, great-grandmother, the Baba Hudus, Saftalea's Saftal mother and Marshida's mother, she was a Shatchanit Begalil Bizman Amadad. She was a Shatchanit during the mandate. And she also was a jewelry designer. And she was very, very sharp. She didn't approve of the wedding of her granddaughter to this boy because he was secular, okay? She called off the wedding three times. They finally got married. And the scandal of the wedding is they stayed in bed for two days. And two days later, he was murdered. To this day, they don't know who murdered him, whether it was a very crazy relative. Did, 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 is there a name for this guy? Yes, David Kraus. Okay. okay. And Chaya is now a widow. Yeah. And Chaya my own my, my Rashida, her father found out that David Kraus came from a Hasidic family in Hungary and had a brother who was 13. So they schlepped in the middle of World War II from Palestine to the northeast of Hungary to Shatra Uhli to participate in Yibum and Chalitza, which is a very, you know what that is? You don't know what Yibum and Chalitza is? No. Is it like Palsa Denora? 
Is it what? Palsa Danura. What's that? Palsa Danura in Aramaic is like, a, it's like a, what they what they were doing underneath Robin's house. They were, you know, all these no. rabbis coming down and telling, hoping that someone would take his life. And, no. No. Okay. There's a whole Gemara called Yavamos, which is about this. Ruth, the Begillat Ruth. Sure. There was Yibum and Chalitza and Ruth because Ruth, Naomi, I think, married. Um, a Gare. Married a man, Boaz, I think. Not Boaz. She married a man who was Naomi's, uh, not Naomi, Ru Ru Ruth's mother, I think, or Ruth. At any rate, Ruth had two sons, and um, one of her daughters in law got married to her son. He died. So they had to perform Yibum because Boa, because Yibum is, I don't know how to explain it. They have to do this ancient ceremony because you have to marry the brother of the deceased if he's still above 13. Okay. Not only that, they have to perform this ritual where the woman has to take the shoe off the man. No, the man has to take the shoe off the woman the man throws the shoe at the woman, and she spits at him. That's called chalitza. Okay, I know. It's a very demeaning yeah, thing. Well, you should look it up. Doesn't sound very... So, Moshida wanted his daughter to have a kosher marriage, a second marriage. So she had to go through yibam chalitza first, which she did. Now, it turns out that Chaya, when she came back from that trip, met a guy, okay, called, um, oh, I forgot his name. He was a revisionist, and Chaya and that man married, and they have a daughter named um, Ora Achimeir, who was married to Yaakov Achimeir, who won the Pras Israel and was they the Walter Cronkite right, of Israel. And Ora wrote a book. And his brother also. Right, Yosef brother. was the head of Lishkat Shamir. Yeah. Okay, and he's the head of the Eitzel Museum now. Yeah. So Ora, okay, is, is my father's first cousin's daughter, okay. my second cousin, I guess. And she wrote a book called Kala, which tells this whole that story, story. Okay. which was up for the Sapir. Really? Yes, and she, there were nice. five. Wow, the Sapir Prize, very yes. nice. Let, I want to get back to your father. Okay. So your father's born in Mashavim. Right. I, I forgot his first name? Moshe. Moshe. Moshe Yosef. Moshe Yosef. He, he's born in Mashavim into an Orthodox family. Very Orthodox. Very Orthodox. Karliner. Karliner. They're from, roots are from Poland though, correct? Poland on his mother's side, uh -huh. Kiev, Ukraine on his father's side. side. Your mother's side is Hungarian. Right. Okay. Just getting it, Got getting it. it straight. Right. Your father's born in 1919. That's, right. That's like, uh, it, it, there's still, uh, the, the Palestine is still being ruled by the by, British. By the, well, not only by the British, but it's martial law. So right. It's, like, it's a so, mandate. It's a ma no, the mandate comes in 1920 when Herbert Samuel comes. Right. Then it becomes like a, a right. snap mandate. Right. He, it's still like uh, after But he the war, came with a British passport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he was born in a, yeah, right. he was born, in, the British were there already. Right. The first three years, 1917, 18, and, 17, 18, and 19, the arm, the military still ran the country. In 20, Herbert Samuel came and be, became the first, um, uh, the first uh, general counsel of the mandatory state. He Army. was Jewish? Herbert Samuel, of course. Yeah. But it worked. But it was a British citizen. Herbert Samuel, you know the Tayelet in Tel Aviv. Yeah. Herbert Samuel, it's right. Named after him. And now it's uh, the hotel in Kikar Tzion. It's called Herbert. It's called oh. uh, Herbert Samuel. Really? Yeah. yeah. But anyways, so your father grows up in Masharim, right. which is um, kind of a very poor neighborhood. Very. It's very poor. Very poor. Uh, very, uh, you know, run down or whatever you want to call it. Um, and you said that at what, at what age does he immigrate to the States? You have to how, how, how old is he? He was eight or nine. He came wow. in 27 or 28. Now, my grandfather, the Carliner, whose grandfather's grandfather was named Moshe Yosef, Reb Moshe Yosef, who came from the Ukraine in 1840 with eight children. Okay. My grandfather was a furrier. He became a furrier. But he moved to America seven years before my grandmother came and opened up a Talis shop in Brownsville in Brooklyn with his younger brother, okay. my, my great uncle Zadel. 
He came. So your, your grandfather had left to the States before. Seven years before my father. Yes, 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 yes. Right. So, so to the was, Golden of Medina. It was in the works. Like, yes. I'll go there. I'll get make some uh, money. I'll make some money. But he came to Israel once during that time. Uh -huh. And then he came again and told my grandmother to take all the children and come to America. But she got pregnant. And I have my uncle Normie who just died. Um, How old is he? 82 or something like that. He was the youngest of all the children of my father's siblings. What number, what number child is your father out of, out of his He had siblings? an older brother, Yeshayahu, Charlie. He had an older sister, Esther, who's Shalom's mother, made my mother. Him and my uncle Nomi. And there were a couple of kids that died. You know, girls. Chana was one of them. She died in America. Um, so all the kids came eventually around 1928, 29. It's amazing because, you know, at that time, I mean, also your mother's family immigrates. Right. Your father's exactly. family immigrates. But my and America is like total isolationist. And my mother's family and my father's family didn't get along. We'll get to that in a sec. But you understand, like, nobody's immigrating in the late 20s. No. It's not happening. No, I don't know how it happened because I, get he, I guess he got citizenship, my grandfather. Maybe he got citizenship. Maybe he, he could uh, prove that they won't be a liability on, right. on the so on the. So By that time, he was making a living as a furrier. Sure. In, 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 in Brooklyn. In Brownsville. In Brownsville. So in, he had a factory. So not a factory, but he had a store. He had a store. So both of your parents, by the age of, let's say, 10, they're in America. In America. They're in Brooklyn, yep. right? In Brooklyn? Both. both. My mother in Williamsburg, my father in Brownsville. Just a side note, my mother's from Brooklyn. Oh, where? She's from East New York. Oh, well, George we, Avenue. Well, we, 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 Brownsville is very close to East New York and East Flappers. Um, and my whole side of the family is, that whole side of the family is all Lower East Side, then Brooklyn. Um, when do your, when and how do your parents meet? My mother's older sister, okay. my aunt Hannah, married my father's older brother, Yeshayahu. Okay. At the wedding of Yeshayahu and Hannah, my mother was 14, my father was 18. They were both very handsome. I can show you pictures. Please. They're, they're gorgeous, both of them. And I'll take a picture of it after, okay? Okay. With the camera. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Here's my mother in 1945, wow. right before she had me. Okay. Here is my grandmother and grandfather, my father's father, my father's mother. Here are my parents at their wedding. Wow. They were gorgeous, both wow. of them. What year did they get married? 44. 44. Here is my mother, my grand, my mother's mother. It's so typical of that generation. Never smile. Right. Never smile. And these are all, these are all her Siblings. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. That was in Williamsburg, I guess. Um, who's that? There is my grandfather with my aunt Esther, my uncle Charlie, my father, and the youngest one. I don't know if that's known. I think that's Hana, the one that died. Then here's my mother in the fifties with all her siblings: my aunt Clara from Brazil, her, my aunt Faye, and. Aunt Hannah, who were twins, and Aunt Hannah married my Uncle Charlie, who was my father's older brother. Your father's older brother. So your and parents meet, so that's crazy. I mean, that's... that's they meet at the wedding. My mother's 14. She's very beautiful and very well developed. And, and, and my father walks over to her and says, I'd like to take you out for a date. She says, I am 14. Call me when I'm 18. He calls her when she's 18. They really? go on their first date to the um, theater in Brooklyn where Frank Sinatra was performing. Okay. They fall in love and they get married. And they have me. Are you the first, are you the first child? Firstborn. Huh? Firstborn, married Firstborn. nine months after their wedding. Um, <clears throat> looking at those pictures, right. families don't look like Masharim type no. of... No, but I'll show you Masharim type. Wait, but did they, did they get, were they American? They came to America. And the fr here's my grandmother and grandfather in Mayash Irene okay. at their wedding. Got it. 
like my grandmother was six, uh, 17, okay, or six, like he's, he's like 15. Okay, but this is the Me'asharim, this is the religious, okay? So, they come to America. This is the Kiddush cup, actually, that Shabtai, my great-grandfather on my mother's, grandmother's side, gives to every ch ch child that, um, that was, uh, got Kirshenbaum, that was, I have it. Okay. Um, so your parents... So my parents come to America. My mother... Tell me a little bit about your mother. She goes to, does she go to yeshiva school? What does she do? Like, no, where does she get She educated? went to public high public, school. Public high school. I mean, so that's like a total... And they were poor. They had okay. borders. They had what? Borders. B-O-A-R-D-E-R. And my mother was sexually harassed. As by the borders. By the borders? Borders. Explain to me what borders are. A border. B-O-A-R-D-E-R. -E they rent a room in your house. They board. Okay. Room and board. Okay. So that's how, they, that's how they got money. That's how they got money. They rented space. Right? So my mother... They all went to public high school. Okay. And they went to the movies. My grandmother also was very into the movies. Okay, they went to the movies. They were religious. They were Shomrei Shabbat. But they were no longer Hasidic. Hasidic. Huh? What? And there's this, a, a famous sentence in, in, from the Bible or from the Gemara. Bevetcha tihyeh mishata. And like... Like the AUD, like for right. a lot of a lot of German Jews, Mizrahi were like that at home, Jewish. Right. But when you walk out, but they were religious. Yeah. They were all were religious. My uncle became a rabbi. My other uncle became a chazan. The women were they were a little more lax with the women. But um, so she went to public high school. Yes. What about your father? What about his education? My father went to a very religious yeshiva in Brooklyn. Okay. What's the name of that religious yeshiva? Very religious. Chachvetz Chaim. Chafetz Chaim. He went to Chafetz Chaim. But the first thing that happened to my father when he got off the boat in 29, 27, they cut his payas off. So he was brought up essentially what today would be called modern orthodox. Sure. He was, they would Sionim and they were uh, Habonim and you know, all the lefty organizations they got involved with, even though they were very involved with revisionist Judaism somehow. Okay, so they were involved somehow. They were very oh, religious. My, they were Shomrei Shabbat, Shomrei Kashrut, like that. But my father was kind of assimilated. Not assimilated, he was religious. And they lived in Brooklyn in a little ghetto-like, and they were religious. So they get, they get married in 44, you're born in 45. Right. Um, do you, did your parents ever mention to you or talk to you about um, I mean, I'm sure you're way too, probably too young to remember, but um, in, uh, in 1946, 47, 48, there's a lot of activity in New York. Lots. Going on. My, with, they, my parents remember, my father was very involved, so, not my mother. Okay, I want to I I try and, and open that up because for me, that's what's, I've been interviewing a lot of people here in the States. I'm here for three months. I'm traveling all around the States interviewing people for the archive. I've been mean, interviewing people who weren't in Palestine fighting for the war, but they were here, they were putting stuff together here. Right. And they were like very active. And that is not, that is just as important a part of the story which people don't really think about. And that's why this is, this is an important part that I would like to try to open up as much as possible. My Aunt Esther, who married Shalom's father. Right, your mother's sister. My, my father's sister. My father's oh, sister. Oh, yeah. My father's sister, Esther, Esther went to a Shomer Hatzair meeting on Friday night. And she went because they did the Hora and it was Israeli. But my uncle Nat, Shalom's father, who was a revisionist from Poland and spoke Hebrew and was very, very right wing and uh, idolized Jabotinsky, he met her there. But he was very disillusioned by what was there because it was so left wing. But eventually he falls in love with her and marries her, and they became very, very well-to-do. Shalom has five other brothers and sisters. They all grew up in Lawrence, Long Island. My uncle Nat founded a um, wholesale grocery store that stocked all the groceries on the uh, East Coast. It was called Met Foods, and then it became associated now. And they, he was very well-to-do. Okay. He started with a pushcart. Okay, like, like, like most. Right. 
But he was very revisionist and very Zionist and very Israeli and spoke Hebrew. And, and your father did My he... father slept along with his oldest sister. They were very close. So they were very close. So he was very influenced by Esther. Very. So Esther... And they remained close till the day she died. And, 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 and do you know, did your father ever talk to you about yes. what he did? And what, yes, they was... danced. It was very... It, it was Horas, it was very Israel, 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 Zionism. They were very involved in Hakamat HaMedina here. In the States. In the States, in Brooklyn. Okay, they were very, very involved. Because in Brooklyn at this time, uh, there's a lot of activity of Haganah. Right. Irgun. Right. Weapons. Right. Uh, machinery, clothing. Right. Right. Uh, right. You know, there's an embargo, so it's got to be very hush hush. Right. Now, Abba Achimeir, sure. Yaakov's father, wrote the treatise upon which the Ugun Tzva'ilu Umi was created. Right. Giving Jewish boys permission to kill the British. Jabotinsky called Abba Admor, Adonenu, Morenu, Virabenu. It's an honorific that only a Hasidic master gets. Okay. He was accused of the murder of our Lazaroth in yeah. 33 yeah. and was g cleared. Of course he was cleared, but yeah, yeah he was, you know, right. that was... He was very, very scandalous. <clears throat> that was what, the beginning of the rift. Right. You know, in the and that year also, 1933, was when the Zionist movement split in the Zionist Congress in Prague. That was like the first split... Between Jabotinsky and Ben-Gurion? And Ben-Gurion. Uh, ben and Weizmann. Ben that was like... 33 right. was like... Everybody likes to think about it as when Hitler came to power, blah, 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 that's right. true. But it's also... It's and it culminated in the Altalena. Lozarov, I, I interviewed yesterday a gentleman in Reseda who was on the Altalena. Wow. That's big. From Czechoslovakia. And he was... You know, now, do you know who was the commanding officer who shot the first cannon at the Altalena? Yeah. Yeah. At Ben-Gurion's orders. To he was 21. Totach Azav. Totach HaKadosh. HaKadosh Azav. Hakadosh, Maybe. one of them. Now, my sister, who's Haredi, who's six years younger than me and wasn't even born during the time right. of the Altalena, when Rabin was assassinated, I called her in Israel and I said, um, Rabin was assassinated. And this is what my sister said. Chevle Mashiach, the birth pangs of the Messiah. And then she said, what goes around comes around. <laughs> Referring to Rabin. Now, I'll show you a picture of my sister so you'll get that. I'll understand. He is my sister. That's your sister, okay. And I'll show you my nephews. Oh, here's Orachimeir with me and my sister. About the, my, uh, the wedding of my nephew. He's a, a very respected journalist in Israel. Yeah, very. Uh, here's Achimeir. my sister's son, one of them. You can see how religious they are. You know where I was when Rabin was assassinated? In Gaza. Really? I, I, this is my other nephew, and this is my brother. He's a docent at Yad Vashem, brilliant. He brought up Haredi, they, they, and here's my niece. And this is her in a wig. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but anyway. But they moved back to Israel. I, I, you know, which you just mentioned that that brought the, you know, these whole things and these riffs. I interviewed, I, we've interviewed for this project over 4,500 people in the last decade, mostly in Israel. 90% in Israel. And in Israel, when we do this, we come with a cameraman and an interviewer. We do it very different. Here I'm alone because of logistics and budget and stuff like that. And we came to a guy's house named Gavriel. I can't remember his last name, but he was at Ishlechi. Okay? And he was one of the last guys to be on, the, on, on, on death row in Akko. Okay? But I thought that he was pardoned because you know, Israel became a state and whatever. And when we walked into his house, the cameraman was setting up, and his wife pulled me aside and she said, listen, my husband uh, about six months ago had a, a, a mini stroke, and he, he, he gets very upset, you know, and he, don't mention Ben-Gurion's name, <laughs> please, it, because it would get really, and I was like, I, I, was like, I understand. Now, Panina Kirshenbaum, did you interview her? Wait a second, yes, we've been, we, she's been interviewed. So this guy that I interviewed, Gavriel, really good looking guy with like this really thin mustache and, and you can tell that he was built too, I mean he was, you know, and we interviewed him and we, I, after two hours I said, Gavriel, I'll, I mean, I'll come back tomorrow because after two hours you gotta stop, it's too much. And I came back the next day, I started interviewing him and I forgot. And I said, 
Moreshet Ben Gurion, the legacy of Ben Gurion, and the guy stood up, and he took off the neck mic and he threw it on the floor, and he said to me, "There is the door." Very calmly, in front of the <laughs> in front of the. So it's so it's yeah, so, so engraved. It's so engraved, like and this guy that I met yesterday, um, Gabriel Lichman, Lichman. I mean, he's he's 91 years old today, and when he's telling me the story of the Altalena. You could see that he, he, he still can't I get goosebumps. He still can't comprehend that they, what, the, that, what the hell happened. That there. the left killed. What, what, you yeah. know, like, and, and he's just, you know, and not to talk about the refugees that were in there and the, the arms. And now, everything. Panina's brother yes. was in the Etzel and the Lechi, and they didn't know. And actually, I interviewed a woman in Detroit. And Newman, who was in the Etzel and the Lechi, yeah. also is. And he was killed by the British. He was killed by the uh, British. Yes. He was killed by the British. He's buried in um, uh, uh, Har Ha Zaytim. Har Zaytim. So. My family, they're all buried in Har Zaytim. Har Zaytim. And you can see eight generations. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. That's Both my mother and my father's side. That's amazing. My that's parents are buried in Har Menuchot. They're buried in Har Menuchot. Now, your parents, you said at one point they do go back to Israel or they. Yes. They go back to Israel. When did they go back to Israel? I'm just fixing the aperture because the light went down a little. In the 60s. In the 60s, they go back. And my Aunt Esther went back in the 40s, right after the Hakamata Medina, okay. right after the nation was formed. They had a lot of money. My Aunt Esther took my grandparents to Israel. My parents went in the 60s. I went in 65. I then volunteered for the Six Day War in 67. Yeah. I was in medical school. I was in Aza. I was a Chavesh. You were in medical school at the time. I went to medical school. I, I was like very young. Film producing in medical school. It's right. Like, I love it. I went to medical school during the Hametach. Before. Before the war. Like that 30 whole, days whole day. before the yeah, war. Yeah, yeah, May yeah. 15th. May, yeah. I didn't let my parents. I was brought up as a Zionist. It was freaky. It was, everybody was freaked out. I didn't tell my parents. Me and a cousin of mine got on a plane, an Air France jet that was gutted by the Rothschilds and filled with spare parts and material for the Israeli Air Force because the Israeli Air Force was a Mirage or Mystere Air Force. It was French. Yeah. And they knew that to go, if Israel would attack, that the Gaulle would put an embargo on spare parts. So JFK Airport, or whatever it was called at that time, had hundreds of Air France jets that they leased, the Sikorskys and the Rothschilds, Fill them with spare parts and material for the Israeli Air Force, and they're going out. I went on one of those planes. I, really? I've uh -huh. never heard that story. Well, then de Gaulle, when Israel did defend itself and preemptively attacked, he did embargo, sure. which is why the Israeli Air Force is now an American F-16, F-35 oh, Air Force, because fuck them. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, that's what happened. Well, right. the embargo... But that's interesting. I never heard that story about these planes. Yes. Sikorsky's Jewish helicopters. Sikorsky, Sikorsky, Sikorsky yeah. and the Rothschilds. So they bought, they, they bought all planes, like they, cargo French Air, Air France planes, and they flew They them. gutted them. They were regular f planes with seats. And they gutted them all out? Hundreds. Where, where did they get the spare parts from? From Kennedy? Wherever. Wherever. And you were in one of these planes? I was in one of these planes. How did you find out about this? I mean, like, how did you... You know, remember. in those days, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, That's great. You had friends who told you. Then when I landed in Israel about three or four days before the war, my cousin Panina, who was the Maskirala Nasi, she was the president's secretary, introduced me to a um, army person. And the army person somehow got me in the Tzahal. I had a six-hour Tironut. They gave me a bayonet because when I landed in Israel on May 16th, the rabbis were digging graves all over Tel Aviv. So the, I, I, I did this Tironut, and I was waiting, and I was in a unit. I forget which unit I was in, but it was a Chavesh. It was a, okay? When the first day of the war, when they conquered Aza, they shipped me off to Aza. I was in Rafiach. They handed me a bayonet, and I did triage and amputations for three days. On the fourth day of the war, my commanding officer knew about my family. who were called Vatikei Yerushalayim, the ancients of Jerusalem. And he said to me, Zahal has just conquered the old city. Go there. You should have this chut to be there because of the family that you come there. I was there when Rabbi Gorin, who was Shlomo Gorin, who's the chief Ashkenazi rabbi, blew the shofar, the ram's horn, on Har Habayat, on the Temple Mount. You were there. And it blew my mind to smithereens. 
Now I was transferred to the Hadassah Hospital, okay, because I went there between my third and fourth year of medical school. In, uh, in, uh, in Karim? In Karim. And I was there, and 30 days after the war, Leonard Bernstein, do you know who that is? Came to conduct Mahler's Resurrection Symphony on the newly reconquered Harat Sofim, and he came to visit the volunteers at the Hadassah Hospital, most of whom were Scandinavian, I might add. And I was standing there in my whites, with blood-stained white shoes and a stethoscope hanging out of my pocket. And he looked at me and he said, oh my God, you look just like this guy that I know that was a waiter at a disco, my waiter at a discotheque in New York. And I answered him in Hebrew, Adoni, Ani Hayiti HaMetzah Whereupon he gave me two tickets to this concert. And I took my cousin Rachel. And Lenny Bernstein, after the concert at the party at the King David, asked me if I wanted to be a gopher on the documentary that they were making about him conducting the Tizmoret HaPhilharmonit, the IPO, in the Shtachim for the Tzahal. And you couldn't get in there. It was a war zone, unless you knew somebody. So I became his gopher. I became his gopher. And one night I walked into his tent and came out on the other side. And he had, was married with three children. I got very close to him. And he would say to me like this, you should leave medical school and go into the arts you will never bow to the mistress of science. And I didn't know what he was talking about. He took me on vacation with his wife and three children. He always traveled with an entourage, boys and girls. And then I went back, I went, after the vacation in Italy, I went back to Israel, worked on another documentary that Jules Dassin was directing, who was Melina McCurry's husband, also about the Six Day War. Then I went back to medical school in Philadelphia at Hahnemann, which is now Drexel. And the, week, the first week that I was there, I was assisting on an amputation, and I'm listening to Lenny saying to me, you'll never bow to the mistress of science. I decided to take a leave of absence. So I come to New York. I say to Lenny, took a leave of absence. I listen to you. He said to me, well, I'm married with three children, but I'll introduce you to three of my best friends. So he introduced me to Catherine Hepburn, who was doing a musical called Coco, about Coco Chanel, um, that Alan J. Lerner, who wrote My Fair Lady, the book and the lyrics for, wrote the book and lyrics for Coco, and Andre Previn, who was married to Mia Farrow, wrote the music. So I became her assistant on Coco. Then he introduced me to Stephen Sondheim. Okay. I became very close to him. And then he introduced me to Kay Thompson, who wrote Eloise at the Plaza. Okay. So that's my story. So that's how you got into Phil? Is that's that how I got into Leonard Phil. Bernstein? Yes. You know what? I can't remember who it was on this trip that I've been in the States told the story, this is in 1948, of Leonard... Lenny came to Yerushalayim. Not to Yerushalayim, near Yama Melach, right. near Stone. Right. They flew in a Dakota. Right. But he also performed in the west side of the city. I'm talking about, but I'm talking about 48. Yes, in yeah. 48. And th this guy, who I interviewed, he was Machal, that's what I was. But I'm talking about 48. Right. They were. They, but I was considered machal sure. then. Yeah, yeah, of course. Right. Dev Chutzla. Right. Exactly. I was what they, today they call a chayal bodeh. Chayal bodeh, but machal was, right. the, was, the, right. was the word. And he told this amazing story of they sent him because he spoke English. They're in, they're in Stom. They're, they're like, there's like 30 soldiers there. They're, 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 like, they're in the middle. They're in nowhere. And they call this guy in, and the, the lieutenant or whatever says, you need to go to the airfield near um, near where today is Dimona or something or wherever there's you know and there's going to be a, a plane landing and you got to bring there's some concert or something you got to bring it and Leonard Bernstein. So Lenny had a, uh, an Israeli boyfriend, okay, named Azaria Rappaport, okay. who was called the handsomest man in Israel. He was an artist. He has a daughter named Tali Shachak Lipkin. Of course. I told Ron Prosor who was the, the ambassador um, whose son married Tali's his, his son, son married Tali's daughter okay right. or his daughter married Tali's son something like that and he didn't know that Azaria who was the boy's grandfather was Lenny Bernstein's boyfriend <laughs> and I knew Lenny I knew Azaria because Az my parents belonged to B'nai Zion which is a fraternal organization and they had a chapter called the, the Shalom chapter and Azaria Rappaport used to come in to my parents' place in Brooklyn when I was five. I remembered him, how good looking Azaria. he was. Yeah, himself. Was he, was he a painter? Or he was a painter, was and painter. he was also involved with B'nai Zion. 
He was the handsomest man that you've ever what seen. What can you tell me, about, if we're talking about it over here, what can you tell me about Leonard Bernstein's connection to, to Israel? To he was had the very, very connected. He spoke a fluent Hebrew. Did he, yeah? Yeah, and he came to Israel a lot. Yeah. Okay, and when he came to Israel in 67, it was 20 years after 48, 19 years, and he was now Leonard Bernstein, hail the conquering hero. He was Lenny Bernstein then. He had just been made the head of the New York Philharmonic sure, but he in 46. He wasn't the megastar. He wasn't the megastar, no. you know. But everybody in Israel loved him and knew him and idolized him because he was a pro-Israel from 26, when he was 26, in 46, okay? Because he helped a lot with raising money, okay? For whatever. Sure. funny because uh, uh, about a year ago I was with a friend of mine, I was at my friend's house in Jerusalem and uh, her mother was there and we were, we were sitting and talking and her mother was telling us how during the Yom Kippur War she was in Dover Tzahal, which is the uh, army right. spokesperson, army spokesperson, she was like 20 years old, beautiful Kurdish woman, half Kurdish, half Moroccan, like and uh, they tell her that she has to go to Ben Gurion Airport to pick up, or then Lod Airport to pick up, and it was Leonard Cohen, who demanded to go to the front. Do you ever see that picture of him and Ari? Oh Charon yes, I did. And Mati Kaspi. Yes, I did. They're just playing. They're right. like, you know, and and he 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 too was a big Zionist. He yeah he was yeah. but 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 Lenny, Lenny was Bernstein, a really yeah but Lenny, that's what I wanted to ask you because also you, you knew him personally very well that he he had this you know gigantic connection to Israel gigantic. Like you can't believe. Spoke fluent Hebrew, you know, and was the head of the Israeli Philharmonic, the, the, Jew, the Jerusalem Philharmonic, I think. Uh, Wasn't he involved with the Jerusalem Philharmonic? I'm sure he was. Yeah, I'm sure he was. For sure. I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was. But he had a lover. He was married with three kids, but he had a lover from '48 on. He met Azaria in '48, and he was close to him till '67. I mean, they were. I knew him. I knew him when I was a kid, but I also knew him through Lenny in 67. So Lenny's actually the one who pushed you into film? Yes. It's amazing. You'll never battle the mistress of science. <laughs> Steve, thank you for your time. I think, I think we, we have... Is there you, anything else that we didn't talk about, that, about the family or about... Um, let me think for a second. Just think here. for a sec, because... Well, my grandmother's sister in Haifa, she uh, married a man named Matri. The, the name was Rizal. And uh, how do you remember all this family? You should. Inter are you going back to Israel? Yeah. You should introduce. You should interview Ora Benarzi, whose husband Yossi Benarzi was the uh, uh, head of the Haifa University. Okay. And they are a big lefty family. Okay. Very big. And they were very left-wing and weren't religious. That, but we're still you all told, close. You told me about that side of the family. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. the... I, I would believe that we have interviewed someone, because we've interviewed 4,500 people. You might have interviewed them. Oh, I'll check it out. Because they were very, very involved. Okay. You know, very involved in Hakamad Hamdina. Haganah, very Haganah, involved. Yeah, yeah. Very. Yeah. But your family was a little bit more... Your they family. were involved in politics. They were involved in the politics of the time. What was the left-wing party? Mapai. They were very involved with Mapai. Now, you could uh, get a job. Nissan you, Matri, yeah. who was my grandmother's sister's son, uh -huh. who was the father of Orit Ben Artsy, mm -hmm. um, took me, took the whole family on a um, day tour to Tzfat and took us around that whole area. My grandparents, Shabtai and Hudas, are buried in Tveria. I know exactly where that cemetery is. Yes, and I know... Who's buried there also, the Rambam. Oh, Rambam is buried there? Wow. Now, I took my grandfather, once we... I was in Israel already, having been in the war, and then my grandfather, who was very sick, wanted to see Yerushalayim one more time. And I flew back to America to bring my grandfather to Israel. And then I visited him a lot. And he stayed there? He stayed there? there, but he came back to America and died not long after. That's right. And your My grandmother died in 65. 65? My grandfather, grandfather died in 67, I think. 67? Died not long after. 67 or 68. And, and the language that was spoken in your house, was English? English and Hebrew. My father spoke Hebrew. We were all named with Hebrew names. Yeah. I'm Tzvi, my sister's Freda, my brother's Shaptai. Um, 
You know, my uncle Nat and Aunt Esther had a very big influence on us, and they named all their children. Ora, Shalom, Hadassah, um, Aryeh, Tamar. Did you meet Tamar Peterson? No. Who's Shalom's sister? No. She's Haredi and she has nine children, and she's a sex therapist for Haredim. They moved back to Israel. They, my they sister's needed, best they friend. Needed, they needed more, than, more she, than everybody. So, but my parents spoke Yiddish. Not to me, because they didn't like Yiddish. It was the language of the ghetto, because my uncle was a revisionist, and he started this school that was, uh, in those days, yeshivas were taught by Holocaust survivors who spoke Yiddish, and they didn't understand American kids. My uncle started a school called the Bialik School, which taught us Zionist values, American values, and progressive. And they only, now I only went to Hebrew-speaking camps, Masad, and Hebrew-speaking schools, Bialik and Yeshiva Flappish. So my father I spoke Hebrew with. Hebrew? And English, but most, yeah, but half and half. Hmm. And they went back to Israel when my brother was four to live for a couple of years. My mother didn't like it, my father loved it. Then they went back, and they both died there. In the States? No, they both died in Israel. In Israel. They went back to America, then they went back to Israel they again. Back, so it was a constant? Constant, two and four, of constant. My father could never make up his mind we wanted to live. He's in love with Yerushalayim. And what's your connection today to Jerusalem? Do you go there Gigantic. Often? I go a lot. You go a lot. When my parents were alive, I went five times a year. Sure. I taught a master class in creative film producing for seven years under the auspice of the Jewish Federation of LA. Where? At Tel Aviv University. Uh -huh. And I taught the Israelis. I did it for two weeks every June. I taught the Israelis how to sell their IP to American buyers. Okay. So successful was I. At the Cobra? Yes. Uh -huh. So successful was I that the Israelis... No, not as Copro. No, at the Copro. The Copro is the co-production uh, no. thing in Tel Aviv every no. year? No. 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 Okay. No. I taught the Israelis how to sell... Well, maybe. Some of them. Mm -hmm. Because the Israelis sold 55 formats, among them in Treatment, Homeland, Tyrant, Dig, The Affair, and Fauda. I'm the godfather of all that. I taught the Israelis how to do that. Okay. And I'm flown all over the world to honor me. So, I go a lot. Good. I love it there. I speak fluent Hebrew. I used to love Jerusalem. I still love Jerusalem, but I stay now more in Tel Aviv because show business is more based there, and I, you know, I'm, I'm more secular. I'm a Zionist, but I'm secular. Okay. Because what happened to me in Israel in 1967, after Israel conquered Yerushalayim, I took my yarmulke and tefillin and threw them away, tzitzis, up until that time was around, and I wrapped myself up in the Israeli flag. That was in 67? Yeah. Uh -huh. When I was 22 years old. But on my grandfather's deathbed, he made me promise that I would like fill in every day and go to the, um, the fast of the firstborn, the Tzom, uh, tzom Bechorim. <laughs> okay, Tzvi. Thank you. Thank you. I just need you to sign a release form. Okay. And 